Welcome, Take It Up with Jessica Lee. I'm here with Armin Bajik Lee, who is the Senior Director of Product Strategy at Ultimate Software. Welcome. Thank you so Armin. much, Jessica. It's great to be here. I, you know, I, I think that people think of uh, Senior Director of Product Strategy and they think, oh, okay, he's responsible for this part of the business. Right, but right. I want to mention that you were actually the CEO of a company that got bought out mm -hmm, correct. by Ultimate Software. Mm -hmm. And so you've been um, on this seven year journey with this company mm -hmm. before you got bought out. So right. tell us about that company first before sure. we get into Ultimate Software. Sure, yeah. Um, the journey was a little bit longer than that, actually, if I'm like, honest about when it started. Oh. Okay. 2006 is when I first started the entrepreneurial path. Um, I went down that path because I think there was a um, sort of momentous occurrence in my life. I had a friend of mine who was diagnosed with a serious illness. I was really um, drawn to how could I try and use my technology background, my engineering background, um, to try and help. Mm -hmm. And so I created something um, originally called the Experience Project. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a website, a social website. That was designed not around how cool you are, what you look like, with the traditional thing that we think of social, but it's actually yeah. around this idea of sharing human experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so I sort of look at people as a product of their experiences. Some are amazing, some are challenging. Um, the reality is we're a combination of all of those, and sort of the charter of Experience Project was a place where people could be themselves, uh, could share that spectrum of right. experiences. All the emotions. Yeah, I mean, and sort of the format of the, the website was based around people writing stories about the different experiences they had, like it's my first day on the job, or it's my um, going to this particular school, or I'm having a health issue. Um, and we were fortunate enough, the site had um, a large following, about 30 to 35 million active users wow. uh, on a month um, in its sort of heyday. And um, sort of the byproduct of all these folks coming and connecting on their experiences is one, a um, huge payoff for the users was they didn't have to feel alone. I think that's one of the things that I... Um, have always believed is the promise of the internet and ultimately mm -hmm. of technology generically is why do so many people feel isolated or like they're the only ones that are going through X, Y, or Z when there's billion of us, billions of us on this planet. Right. That shouldn't be the case. And right. so Experience Project helped connect um, hundreds of millions of mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that sort of was a derivative of all of this connection based on experiences was we were able to get a sense of how language was used um, to communicate experiences, to communicate mm -hmm. emotions, and critically... Um, humans are wizards with language, right? So it's the best thing that we've evolved to take what's in here and put it out there for mm -hmm. someone else to understand us. And so it's um, unbelievable sort of the variation in how an individual will express their happiness or their worry or their excitement and how that changes um, based on gender, age, geography, even season of the year, of course, uh, time. Um, and so having so many people over so many uh, years, over so many experiences, um, share what they were going through, why, how they felt, uh, gave us this incredible library um, of language, emotion, and experience, which we were then able to sort of um, take to a broader audience in our next version um, of the, the entrepreneurial journey. And Ultimate Software is actually in the HR software business. Correct. Um yes. and a lot of people know about Workday but mm -hmm. may not have heard of Ultimate Software, but they compete. Mm -hmm. So why did Ultimate Software uh, yeah. wanted to bring you into the family? Sure. So um as we got this sort of um ability to look at language with uh, a machine and say, "All right, well, we've been able to see how people use language to communicate their emotions and experiences. Can we then use that to train a computer mm -hmm. to be sensitive to emotions? Mm -hmm. uh, sort of my overriding entrepreneurial mission in life has always been technology has to work with people. People are a combination of logic and emotion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yet that emotion side has been completely unaddressed, right? It's, uh, it's not where we've been comfortable building technology uh, or we haven't had the ability to do so. Uh, and sort of the experience project background gave me a very, very strong um, ability to say, I think I could tackle this challenge. Mm -hmm. And so what we were able to do was build um, technologies that looking at um, language in the form of, let's say, text, in the form of a survey response or um, performance review, which is full of this weighty language, like just sort of the words are there, but there's also a lot in between the lines. Um, we were able to build some solutions that would look at that in real time and say, all right, like this person's talking about 
their manager, but they're also expressing like a lot of worry about the future of the company, or they're really excited about new teammates. And they may not be saying that in those exact words, but because of our ability over the years um, to see all the different variations of how people use language to communicate those experiences, we were able to build um, technologies that could look at that, fill in the gap, mm. uh, and tell you what's explicitly being said, but also what's between the lines. Uh, and we ultimately channeled it into employee feedback because we thought, what's the next step of um, this idea of technology and empathy? Well, you know, hundreds of millions of people are trapped <laughs> day to day in their jobs. There are voices that just aren't being heard, right? We all go to work, we all want to improve our workplace. Uh, yes, there's a survey every now and then, but does anyone really listen? Um, and so we said, oh my gosh, this is the best way that we could sort of follow our hearts of saying, let's hear every voice, like really hear every voice and understand every voice. Um, and let's bring some new technology to bear that might help us accomplish that. And so we built an employee feedback product that we called Perception. Mm -hmm. um, and Ultimate Software um, was drawn to that because it was a really good fit with their product portfolio, but also with their overall culture, which is people first. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you want to build an organization based on um, a healthy culture and respect for the organization's um, key players, which are really bottoms up, your frontline employees on up, sort of a reverse view of the typical structure where you focus on the executives. Um, their view was that if you could unlock um, opportunity, engagement, productivity uh, in the everyday uh, frontline employee, you could have truly scalable progress. Right, so right. we fit that mold really, really well. Uh, and so we were able to sort of come together uh, now almost three years ago, and it's been a pretty strong success story since then. Okay. Yeah. That, what you're saying is that certain companies that uh, have um, maybe try everything they can to mm -hmm. have great culture, mm -hmm. employee retention and all that, but still something's not right. Yeah. And, and this is where your software can come in and help because sure. it's listening, yes. uh, monitoring, mm -hmm. and then be able to give feedback to yeah. improve yeah. So the way I always look at it is I was CEO, right? <laughs> so there's always the problem that keeps the CEO up at night isn't generally a math problem, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just if only I had another hundred dollars to give my employees, everything would fall into place. It's a people challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I think I'm doing everything right. I've got my playbook. I'm hiring from the school I want to hire from. Uh, the market's going the right way. Then why are we not doing X or Y, right? And it comes down to the fact that people are people. Mm -hmm. We have rational and irrational behaviors. And so the most valuable sort of thing that you can do um, to a company is answer those questions that have been viewed as not answerable. Like, I just don't know, so I'm going to try and solve it with gut or intuition see, see. or inertia. Like, we've always done things this way, so let's keep doing it. And we thought, is there a way to bring sort of an evidence-based um, information that isn't just, you know, here's what people get paid or here's how long they worked here, but actually, hey, they're excited about this, they're worried about that, um, and bring that not just to the CEO or the CHRO or the exec suite, but actually say most HR happens at the front line. Yes. Right? Those first line managers who often have the least training, the least capability of a sort of professional management. Let's give that information to them in sort of plain language. Um, and it's not so much about monitoring. That's actually a ground rule of ours is not to monitor um, communications that shouldn't be monitored. It's more surveys basically go out through the product mm -hmm. uh, and the product is then able to sort of examine the results from that survey, um, particularly that open-ended part that says, hey, tell us what's on your mind. I That's see. usually the most valuable part, but also the most challenging part. Um, and so our competition, we don't view it as other companies. We viewed it as people sitting there and trying to read those surveys by hand, mm -hmm. um, which is, of course, you get tired, you get you know biased in how you interpret the results. Um, and so here's an opportunity where um, artificial intelligence can help. Right. Um, so artificial yeah. intelligence requires massive amount of data right. to, to yeah. really see pattern mm -hmm. that's uh, accurate. Right. right. Um, and most companies don't have the massive data right. Right. when you're not yeah. a giant company, right? Sure. So sure. you're leveraging the data from mm -hmm. all kinds of enterprises right. that you've been collecting right. over the years. Sure. Right. Yeah. So it's, uh, I think the. Um, the beauty of machine learning, right, is that every piece of data it sees is like as exciting as the first piece of data, mm. right? Whereas people, you know, like we get tired. We don't learn as much from that hundredth piece of data as we did from the, the first one. Um, and so it's a um, snowball in your favor and that sort of the more data that you've seen, the more value you can give in looking at that next piece of information, the more value you can give to that next piece of information, the more value there is in your product for more sort of um, getting more data, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I think as we go forward and 
you know, machine learning is on the tip of everyone's tongue, um, you identify a really important point, which is you need to have lots and lots and lots of training data. Mm -hmm. um, it has to be extremely diverse and not just in your mind diverse, but truly represent as many inputs as possible. Otherwise, you end up with um, algorithms that are accidentally, uh, unintentionally, um, really good at reinforcing the biases of whoever trained it. Mm. And all algorithms have bias. That's like a topic for a whole other yes. show. <laughs> um, but the broader your data pool um, and the more you've been able to account for different voices, right. different ages, genders, geographies mm -hmm. um, around the world, uh, honestly, uh, the better chance you have of being able to really bring fair um, and, of course, real time, et cetera, all the other benefits, but fairness mm. is pretty important when you're applying machine learning. Okay. Let's touch on entrepreneurship. Sure. I'm sure there's a lot of folks out there who are trying mm -hmm. to make it. Right. <laughs> and you've made it. Yeah. Uh, you want to mm -hmm. share some of your journey sure. advice to sure. the entrepreneurs out there? Yeah. Um, one is just this idea that I think it's finally starting to take hold in Silicon Valley a little bit more honesty around the difficulty of that path, right? There's the allure, there's the um, mystique around being an entrepreneur. I went to Stanford and that sort of the idea that you will have a manifest destiny to start a company and if you don't for some reason that's like letting people down. I think that um, romanticization of the actual challenge, the lifestyle, mm. is one of the things that I've always tried to attack mm. and be honest and say this is a difficult path in life. Yeah. Uh, it's a lonely path, challenging path. You won't have a night of sleep. You won't have uh, a moment's rest. And, you know, the very first piece of advice I always give is don't go down this path unless you're absolutely in love with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, it is not a sort of smart career path. It's not a healthy way to live a life. Um, but for people that do it and they do it because they're motivated by the problem they're trying to solve, mm -hmm. we always look back and we go, we wouldn't do it any other way, even though we know the challenges. And it's because we view it as I must do this. Like right. I was put here to solve this problem. Very strong passion. Yeah, and I look at from some folks that just try and make it a business problem. And yes, you can build maybe a successful business just trying to, to say I see a need in the market and I'm gonna go solve it. But when the journey inevitably turns rough, right, mm -hmm. it's hard to power through that. So again, I, I feel like the change in the environment where people are being a little more honest than that is super healthy. Um, but I will always beat that drum that just know, you know, that there's going to be ups and downs and it's not sort of the magazine style of things. Um, the second thing, and particularly for sort of the, the, the time that we have together today, um, people often ask me, you know, you've been acquired, you've been through that journey, um, you had some intellectual property that um, was considered breakthrough. Was it safe to go and engage, for example, in business development and laying the foundation for acquisition? Should I talk to um, the big corporate players in my space, or should I not should I keep mm -hmm. it close to the best? Um, and sort of the first thing that I always kind of guide people on is without users, you're not anything, right? Like technology for technology's sake is uninteresting, right. particularly in the Valley. Everyone's got something interesting cooking. Um, and so get out there, get people using it, solve real problems, um, because I think the sort of glorification or deification of technology here, it's a risk we run being in Silicon Valley where um, maybe people here will appreciate that you've come up with a new way of natural language processing, but when you're out selling in the Midwest, unless you're really attacking a true business problem and your yeah. technology is a component of that solution, it doesn't matter, right? right? So uh, get out there, get used, get real business problems solved. And the other side is be open about what you're doing because the most realistic sort of play for companies um, is not going public uh, and even running sort of a going concern of being a profitable company uh, if you've taken venture capital, for example, like that isn't, as hard as that is, that may not even be the outcome that your investors are going to coach you to. And so if you are a you know, fiduciary, you're a CEO, you're a founder, you're trying to run a company and have sort of an opportunity to develop your product, your technology, um, you know, give your employees sort of something um, back for the trust they've placed in you, you need to always be cultivating um, the end game that's most likely, which is that um, potential for M&A. Uh, and so I always encourage people, get to know the groups in your space. Don't be so shielded because big companies can't, like they don't have the time to, to copy every random idea they meet. They need to see you build out a market. Um, and the other caveat that I give to that is, don't do it too early, like you need product market fit. If you just go and meet like, a company, um, that conversation you have to begin with will be how they remember you. And so mm -hmm. if years later you come back, you're like, oh, we figured it out, we're doing this other thing, um, you will always have to overcome the inertia of, I remember meeting those people and weren't they doing X or right. Y? And now you have to undo that. Um, and the other tip I can give, I think, is um, there's oftentimes a big misunderstanding for entrepreneurs, particularly first-time entrepreneurs, 
about the role of corporate development. Mm -hmm. And so when they think about this whole challenge that we're talking about, they think, okay, I'll reach out to the corporate dev arm of Microsoft or, you know, Ultimate or Workday or what have you. And that's not really where you want to go when you are a startup, right? The sponsorship of a product for a true acquisition that's successful, where your product lands and expands. You're not just sort of a glorified aqua hire. Uh, you have to be sponsored by the product team. Ah. You should get to know the product people. And it's not the product managers necessarily, it's the VP of product, mm. who is a wildly underutilized like person um, by the entrepreneur world, right? Mm. That um, individual or individuals, if you meet them after you've got your early product market fit, you share your vision, um, one, they're going to be interested because very few people actually reach out to them with this type of um, proposition. VP of product. Uh, right, yeah. And then two, if they're not interested, then it doesn't matter if the corp dev team is interested or if right. the product managers are interested. Right. Sort of, well, that's, they are the strategic sort of guardians. Right. Uh, since now I work in the world of strategy, I right. know this very well. Uh, and so if they bite, um, then you've got something that actually has the opportunity for success. Right. So a couple tips there um, that I've learned through my experience. Uh, it may or may not be useful, but I think, uh, you know, I, I help guide people um, to the idea that time is your most valuable asset. It's hard to realize that because oftentimes we try and overcome our insecurities or our inexperience as entrepreneurs with, I'll just throw more time at it. Mm. Uh, but what I love watching about repeat entrepreneurs is how they've become more efficient. Yes. <laughs> and they've realized that this equation is you can't just throw 20 hours a day, seven days a week at something right, yeah. and expect to be you know, a human and successful and have relationships right. outside of work. And so you find what to do uh, that has higher payoff. And that's you know something I've experienced and I hope that that could be helpful to some folks. Oh, that's that's mm -hmm. great. Thanks for sharing yeah, all that. Pleasure. Yeah. So what's exciting for you now that you're yeah. Uh, you're leading this uh, sure. strategy. Yes. Yeah. So at Ultimate, um, what I have the privilege of doing is sort of guiding where the company goes mm -hmm. um, two and three years out. And the way I kind of explain that to the team is I go, hey, you know, this is a great place to work. You want your kids to work here? I have to be successful, right? Which means everyone has to kind of go along and, and help. Um, that strategy or innovation isn't a nice to have, but it actually is critical to sort of the long-term viability of a company. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a big challenge yeah. at times, right? Because there's so many fires burning, that's right. it's hard to pay attention to that. But um, I think there's nothing more visceral than uh, companies that don't pay attention to this and only sort of switch to it at the last second uh, end up flaming out. Uh, and so I have that sort of um, environment of support around it and uh, value on it. Um, where I spend a lot of my time, given my background, is this idea of can we take some of these really advanced technologies that we built here mm -hmm. Um, and apply them as forces of good and as forces of growth. Um, and in particular, the combination of sort of the culture of Ultimate, which is people first, and this capability to understand the emotional side mm -hmm. of data. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of this really intoxicating opportunity to say, could we use artificial intelligence not as another weapon for the C-suite, which is, I think, the more traditional way to go, but as actually a democratizing force, mm -hmm. where you could say in the past, um, for example, I might have a large overseas um, workforce, direct labor in China, building my products. And in the past, I might have said, you know what, they're fine, or we're fine with them turning over at 100% here. Uh, we can't afford to you know, hear them out or understand how to improve their workday. Um, but now technology comes to bear and says, no, you absolutely can. The same way you were surveying your folks in Manhattan, uh, you're absolutely able to go out there and deploy a survey to all of your frontline employees. They can take it you know, on their phone, they can do typos, they can use emoticons, uh, they can speak in any dialect they want, and the machine will do all the hard work, as it should, mm -hmm. of trying to understand what they're trying to say directly and indirectly and bring that into a sort of an actionable format for their actual managers. To me, that's really exciting to it say, is. all right, this is a new yeah. era where the excuses, either of philosophy, where the you know people were viewed as expendable, or technology, we just didn't have the ability. You know, we're not a rich enough company to hire a Deloitte or a McKinsey to go out and talk to every single person and run an interview. Um, we can kind of attack those fundamental assumptions and say, you know what, things have changed. The technology is there, and you know, within, for example, the confines of Ultimate, the philosophy is there mm. um, to unlock um, the individual as much as you can and help understand them. And that to me gets me very, very lit up about the world of opportunity. Um, it feels very blue sky. Mm. Um, and 
it's with technology in this appropriate supporting role as an assistant to people, uh, not as the end goal in and of itself. And so um, I'm having a lot of fun kind of exploring the boundaries of that and also having a lot of success um, within the company. That's great. I think yeah. the tool that you're talking about is definitely very appealing and it could, it could bring a tremendous benefits for the company uh, with yeah. better employee retention, sure. also better for the employees themselves to be able to voice and maybe have yeah. a better outcome in right. the end for both. Yes, that's hmm. the win-win that you have to go for. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Armin, for being on the show and sharing pleasure. all of this. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me today. Thank you very much for watching Take It Up with Jessica Lee, Armin Bajikli from Ultimate Software. Thank you.